We are honored to have you here with us in our virtual worship here at the Colonial Village Church of Christ. I want to also thank God for blessing us to be on this time side of life, to praise him for all the mindful acts that he has dis displayed for us in our lives. We're thankful to God again for uh, his son dying on the cross for our sins, giving us the right to eternal salvation if we live soberly, godly, and righteously in this ungodly world. We also want to just thank God for looking over us on last night, allowing us to be alive and well so that we can make our calling in our election short through Jesus Christ. I want to take this time to let you know that the salvation of Jesus, according to the Bible, is a now salvation. We emphasize this because tomorrow is not promised unto us or even the next hour. The Bible says in Acts 22, 16, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul concludes, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Then Peter concludes it by saying in 2 Peter 3, 21, the like figure, wherein to baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. It is my prayer, brothers and sisters, friends uh, that have tuned in, that our message will be strength to our spirit. It will stir our soul to keep understanding that we have a God who loves us even in these difficult times. And we're praying and trusting that you will leave after we are done with this message. You'll say, I was glad when they said it to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I want to take this opportunity now to call your attention to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through um, 19. Luke 15, 11 through 19. Luke chapter 15, and the verses are 11 through 19. The Bible says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portions of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as one of thy hired servants. Thus is the reading of Luke 15, 11 through 19. The climatic thought in regards to our subject that we'll give is found in verse 22, Luke 15, 22. The Bible said, but the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found and they began to be merry. That is Luke 15, 20. 2 through verse 24. The thought that I would like to use as a subject, a timely subject, is in Luke chapter is entitled 
That is something I thought my father would never do. That is something I thought my father would never do. Regarding this con the context of the prodigal son, which is from Luke 15, 11 through 32. But the emphasis in is, in is on the father's patience. The father's, um, not so much his position, but his patience. His perseverance to wait for his son. And the reception of his son, the rejoicing when the son is received back into the hands of his father. We want to emphasize this, that the context is, with, is in the entire thought of the father's ability to wait and restore that which is lost. It is seen in, I'm oh, sorry, oh, <laughs> Lord, Emory. and I knew it. In regards to the father's patience and being, and being perseverance in his, his love for his son, we recognize that the father, the context of restoration be actually begin with the, with, with the, uh, the widow woman losing one coin and the urgency of her finding that one coin brought value to her life. The urgency of the shepherd losing one sheep brought about him being responsible for that which is lost. But then the prodigal son brings about one son being lost, and that is in regards to the father's long loving kindness towards those who uh, left home, those who uh, recognize that they're not controlled, but yet they are given a idea of understanding what is better for them. So here in the context then of this text, of the, of, here in the context of this lesson, we want to concentrate on the fact that even as we are looking at Father's Day, fathers are honored in the way that, that they should be honored because of their loving kindness and their labor for the family. Parents, how often can you re recall hearing your children say to you when they are angry, about the rules that you set for them that will help them to be respectful, responsible, and resourceful. And because they did not understand that you were grooming them for adult accountability that will help them in life, they in verbal return have said these words, I can wait until I turn 18 so I can make my own decisions. I can't wait until I leave home and get my own place to live and then I can live how I please. When I have my children, I would not be as strict as you are with me. But as a parent, you perhaps did not raise your voice or even throw a temper tantrum because you know, knew from experience that words spoken without wisdom will always cause us to swallow what we have spoken so prematurely. Because this is true, we as children have said, on our own, our, or our own children have said, that is something I thought my father would never do. Upon saying these previous words, instead of getting, instead of shouting, we just smile. Instead of being angry, we became aff more affable. And because of, instead of griping, uh, we become more graceful because we realize that our children, no matter how old they are, need someone to understand that regardless of the disrespect or the fast mindset of wanting to leave, they too need continual love. Here in the context, however, Jesus is opposing the idea of what the Jews, he is opposing the Jewish ideal how to be in relationship with the Father. The opposition is not so much about, the opposition is, is in regards to the Jews believing that being first in line with God and in positioning ourselves in work gives honor. 
Jesus is showing through these parables <coughs> that honor with God is not about being first, called first. Honor with God is not about position. Honor with God is not about um, how much work one does in the kingdom. But honor with God our Father, what brings honor to our Father is in recognition that God loves us to let us live. God loves us to give us our life blessing. And not only does God love us to let us live and give us our life blessing, but he loves us enough that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin that we may have eternal life. And because of the centric love of God, the nature of love of God, we are, we are automatically driven to praise him for all that he has done for us. Therefore, the subject, that is something I thought my father would never do, it climax in this thought. It begins by us recognizing that the text says in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, that the Bible says a certain man had two sons. The description, the the description of the man with two sons without a name is to automatically point to God the Father who become, has transformed himself, um, has to take on the form of a man to be able to identify with the cares of other men. Not only to be able to identify with the cares of other men, but to show that God himself as a man, it has intimate concern for his father. Any father who works hard and any father who loves his children will do all that they can to keep their child's mind secure, even after they have fallen short of their expectations. Certain man makes us realize that Jesus came down as a form of a man to identify with man's sorrow, man's weaknesses, man's concern, and man's disappointment. In the next verse, the Bible says, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of good that father to me, and he divided into them his living. The historical color of this text brings out the idea that it was not a custom or cultural, it was out of culture for the youngest son to get, the bless, get his blessing before the elder son. The historical color of the context brings out in culture of the, of the, of the verbiage, tradition, that if a younger son requested his father to give him his portion before the older son, he is automatically saying to his father, I wish you were dead. I wish you were gone so I can get my inheritance. But the father in the text pays no attention. The reason why he pays no attention to the cultural setting, because the consolation, um, because he was concerned about the consolation or concerned about the comfort that his son would need when he came back home. God does not control us to where he makes us do what we want to do, but he, he waits on us to help us to understand, by helping us understand how deep his love is for each of us. Then in verse um, 13, 14, 12, the Bible said that he, um, he divided unto him his living. Verse 13, and many days after, the youngest son was gathered all together. He prepared himself to leave. No one ever makes anybody leave God. Nothing in life could cause individuals to want to leave God. People prepare themselves to leave. The, the contrast of the older son and the younger son is this. The younger son prepared himself to leave while the older son positioned himself to stay in, real, in thinking that if he stayed, he's automatically in good standing with the father. The, the younger son prepared himself to leave by selling what he had to go into a long journey to be free from his father. In, re in retrospect, the Bible said after he prepared himself, he began to point himself in a direction and to a far country. The far country represents um, how sin, how far sin would take us to go, how far sin would take us. 
A far country is a place that shows we're out of reach. Our mind is out of touch with God. But God, our Father, is not out of touch with us. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking right now that all fathers who love their children, regardless how far out they go, our mind is always on the protection and the concern of our children. This is why the Bible says that when he, when he, this is why the Bible points out that when he went into a far country, God himself pre already prepared through predestinational blessing that his son Jesus will die on the cross for the sins of the world. We cannot preach a Father's Day message, a Father's Day message without recognizing the sacrifices that Father will do to ensure the safety of his children. Many of us have fathers who work long hours, who will do their best to make sure there's food on the table, clothes on the children's back, uh, that they have a nice, a good place to stay. And the idea is fathers make sacrifice. The father in the text, which is God, in human flesh, is showing that I will always prepare for you a way to come back home. I'll always prepare for you a way for safety and security in this life. In the text, in the text here of this, the, he's recognizing the fact that we cannot control our children. Our children will always make up their mind. But we already know that our children will oftentimes go places and do things that we don't approve of. In this text then, when we talk about the cross, we're recognizing that, one, the cross was given to prove how much Jesus loved us, according to Philippians 2, 5 through 9. The cross substantiates an overarching love for his people. That's why Ephesians says that it talks about the height, the width, and the depth of the love of Jesus. The cross was not a shameful, the cross as shameful as it was, became strength to the world to be drawn onto Jesus. This is God's preparation to win men back to him. In verse 6, 15 then, the Bible says, verse 14, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. When one leaves God and go into a, uh, go into a far country, they have to prepare themselves to leave. Number two, when one leaves God and go into a far country, they have to recognize that there's going to become a day of perplexities, per uh, problems, perplexities and problems. The text says that a mighty famine was in that land and he began to be in want. The wants is, is, is recognized in this sense. That when folk leave God, leave their home, leave their security, they desire the basic wants in life. They desire the presence of their father. They desire the, 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 the love of their father. They desire the, the optimism of their father. They desire not just food and rich clothes. They just desire the fellowship of their father when one leaves God. And then here, verse 16 says, being in want, he went and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave to him. This husk is called a carrot pod, a sweet pulp, um, that animals and people can eat. But it was not this kind of carrot pod. It was a wild carrot, bitter and lacked nourishment. This was what the son was desiring. When one leaves God, they must prepare themselves. When one leaves God, they must recognize their problems, that they are not secure from their problems. And then two, three, when one leaves God, leave their father, they have to consider the, the, 
the lack of health of the mind, body, and soul they once had at home. The health that they once had at home. This text, this context invites us to recognize the destruction of an individual when they leave their father. Verse 15 says he joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And we have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. No man gave unto him. Here is the climax of the text. And when he came to himself, he said, how many highest servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. If any man is going to return home to their father, any person is going to come home to God, they cannot come back to God on their own merits. They cannot come back to God thinking that they have to do a whole lot and God will save them. God saves us because he loved us, loves us. God saves us because that is his nature. That is his character. This context or the context of the parable is teaching you and I that it's God who go out his, this God who search up and down for us. It's like the woman did for her lost coin. It is God who will go out the way, go out of his way to find the one sheep who is lost in the field like the shepherd did for his sheep. And it is God who will stand at the road, stand in the roads of life waiting for us to come home. But as we approach God, we must recognize that he's not going to bring us back because of what we, going, what we have said we'll do. But he's going to bring us back because, he, who it, because of who he is. And he is love. One thing that home needs more of is not father who can give treasures to the sons and daughters, toys to the sons and daughters. Our home needs fathers who, who build trust that even in your mistake, you still have mercy. Even when you're guilty, you still have grace. Even when you're down in the dirt, I will deliver you up from the dirt. Fathers have value, more valuable with the children beyond the stuff that they can give them if they just give their sons and the homes their soul. One thing I want us to recognize is that even in Ephesians 6 where the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment. The Bible says, And fathers provoke not your children to wrath. The word provoke is do not keep staring up their past. I'm glad I know you, God, because even in my past, you have not stirred me up to keep feeling guilty. I'm glad I know you, God, because you have not made me remember all the bad things I've done. You just gave me more. You just promoted me back to sonship. You took off the old clothes, uh-huh, and put on the new clothes. You did not stir me up to say I wish, to the point that I said I wish I never came back home. There's no love here. You did not provoke me, but you... But you promoted me to a status that says everything is going to be all right. You promoted me to a status that said you may have fallen, but I still forgive you. You promoted me to a status that said I will wash away your dirt so that the world could not remember what you've done. Because as you're lost, I am lost. As you're not, if, if you're not happy, I can't be happy. The father waited at the end of the road to receive his son back unto him. And this is something I thought my father would never do most fathers will say, I'm a spank you. But God said, you've been spanked long enough. Most fathers will say, go to your room. But my father says, I have many rooms, not of, not to abandon you away from the family, but to give you a bonded blessing. I'm so glad I know my father. I'm so glad my father don't act carnal. I'm so glad that my father don't hold grudges. I'm glad that my father received me back into his home because if it had not, then my heart would not be lifted. My soul will still be down. Aren't you glad you have a father who cares, who stays with you, looks after you, and wait for you to come home to receive you back into the arms of loving arms of salvation. That loving arm of salvation. The word salvation comes from a word called soteria, which means to rescue. How did God rescue us? He rescued by allowing us to, uh, to by, by waiting on our roles. Many of you are coming from roles of life, dark roles, divorce roles, Hurt roles, lying roles, mistreatment roles, racial roles. Am I right about it? But God is waiting, saying, if you just return, I can make your welcome back home all right. In closing, God loves us. 
He does not merit us based upon us being first in the kingdom. Our salvation is not merited upon us doing a lot of work, but it's merited by the grace of God. Something my father, I thought my father would never do leads me to know that we can never get to know our father total, in totality. But as we know him, we know his love never changes. God bless you and may he keep you. Thank you. Done my wrong, you never left me alone. 